here we go. Good morning, guys. How are you? Good, good, hey. good. I'm really excited to have all you guys here. All right, so let's talk about events, huh? So I would like to actually just start from the beginning of the planning of the event, the thought of the, the, the event. Um, how do trends, how do local trends, either food trends, restaurant trends kind of play into, or eating trends? I know Susan does a lot of that. Um, how does all of that play into what you decide to start planning, whether it's a big blowout or a small tasting? And you know what, Jamie, can I start with you? So this is kind of new for me. Um, and I live um, in an agriculture area, so I'm really just trying to bring in local farmers and educate people um, why to shop or buy local. Um, a lot of the health trends. Um, so that's how a lot of ours um, start. Um, we've been doing a lot of charcuterie workshops and bringing in a lot of local um, cheeses. And it's just a way for people to kind of get to know um, about the local cheeses as well as taste it because their boards are very expensive to make. And so I find people are really liking that because then they get to taste the cheeses. So when they go out to buy, then they're more comfortable of spending that much money. Yeah. How is it? Um... The charcuterie, you've done a <coughs> class with it too. How did that kind of um, come to mind and evolve? Because that's a really different class, a charcuterie class for kids. Well, so. I'm finding, yeah, kids definitely want to get into the kitchen. Um, so, yeah, it was a really fun one, and we just kind of took some of the fancy, like, we didn't have the blue cheese, but we added guacamole <laughs> and um, goldfish, and they were very artistic, so we had <laughs> slate boards. And they would just do these beautiful um, boards. It was really crazy. And I would have like two-year-olds doing it <laughs> up to eight-year-olds. And I loved it. It was very artistic. And they got very excited about doing it. So we'll be doing a holiday one as well. Um, so then they can entertain their family um, and feel comfortable doing it. That's great. Susan, um, the keto trend, Susan actually does keto, but the, the keto trend is so big right now. How has that kind of influenced your um, in-store events and, and the selection for you? One of the things is we do healthy eating class. I call them healthy eating because I want to appeal to more than just a keto. keto. Um, so, but we also do a support group kind of, because keto doesn't have like Weight Watchers and people love going to Weight Watchers to at least talk about their experiences. So once a month we have a meeting that we offer that. We've started to add in our food section some of the lower carb items because you can't find all the sweeteners that you know in the grocery store you pretty much find um sweet and low and in that i carry erythritol xylitol and some of the other sweeteners that are used in baking um, we're also looking at maybe offering some baked goods and things that are made with those products so what we're trying to do is appeal to those people that are trying to cut sugar out of their diet uh, so it's been um pretty successful. Um, actually, I got overwhelmed in January when I tried to have a support meeting, and I was just kind of expecting, you know, 10, 20 of my customers. We had 60 people wow. show up. That's oh. awesome. Yeah. So, you know, and it's people that didn't know about our store. So, wow. you know, we've tried to become involved in that movement. Because, I mean, Winchester itself is maybe, what, 45,000 people. Frederick County is 100,000. Um, you know, so we're not dealing with a huge market, but, you know, trying to get known in that niche because on the other hand, we sell candy too, but right. <laughs> that's not going away because mm -hmm. people love candy and fudge. Yeah. Yeah. Melissa, what about you? What kind of, um, events have been on your calendar lately? Um, well, going with a trend as far as, um, we've done several farm to table type things, working with, uh, local businesses, uh, chefs, restaurants, to bring them in and feature them. But uh, something that we added recently that has had a really nice reception with our customers are gluten-free classes. So we did a gluten-free cooking class and, and talked about how you know, cooking savory, nice meals, like lots of times they are gluten-free and you just don't even realize it. You know, you pick gluten-free things and like you can make all sorts of things uh, and, and not have gluten in it. Um, and th then we did a more complicated one. That, that one went over so well that we decided to do a gluten-free baking class. So that tends to be more challenging. Uh, and invited someone in that talked about all the different flour options 
um, how those flowers react differently versus regular flowers and the types of ingredients you use with them um, and how they are uh, very clean and healthier for you to use in baking. So if you want to have your cake, go ahead and eat it. <laughs> hmm. So um, those both were really well received and we're going to continue to do more of those. Um, but yeah, we do a, a whole slew of different type of classes. Um, for those of you that don't know, we have a fully uh, functioning kitchen in the back of our store. And we try to really connect that with our retail side. And uh, to be part of the community, we uh, reach out to local chefs and restaurants in the area to not to promote them as well and get them out in front of people. And they really seem to enjoy that. So uh, that sort of doubles our reach that way as well. I was going to say, how, do you, how are you cross-promoting <laughs> with the chefs and the different restaurants? How do you right. work with them to build So reach? in the beginning, it was us reaching out and saying, hey, we have this concept, we have this idea. Are you interested in coming in and partnering with us? And everybody seemed to just be on board. You know, it, it's a great community where we are, and uh, the culinary scene is really growing, and people are, are wanting to eat good food and uh, have something different, have that experience that they can do, you know, instead of just going to a movie or just going out to eat. Mm -hmm. um, but the thing is, is they have their favorite restaurants and they, ha they know about these chefs, and lots of times they don't get to see them because they're in the back. And so if we do a class uh, with a restaurant that someone might happen to love, well, then they're signing up because they want to be in there for that. They want to know how they're making those dishes. They want to meet the, the master behind the food. And uh, it's really great. And then we, we also get a hold of some young chefs uh, that are maybe just getting started. And uh, they're also really talented and amazing. Or if there's a local chef that writes cookbooks or released a cookbook, we bring them in and we'll cook things from their, from their book and things of, like that. So. Uh, it's been really nice and it helps us do a wide variety of events so and then do you cross promote them on social media like does your we chef do. do a lot of social media with you or it, it depends okay. um but yes so we'll we kind of own it at first and like we'll create the facebook event pages yeah. uh, we host the class on our website people come through our system to register and buy tickets and that way we can kind of manage that send out recipes, reminders, create the email list, that sort of thing. Um, but then once it's created on like social media, then they begin to share it, they put it on their pages, um, they talk about you know what they're gonna do as well. So it just helps to reach a broader audience. So now Mara, you have the wine store mm -hmm. um, too. So how have you kind of planned events around wine tasting or you know anything a little bit different and tying in the, the housewares, the hard lines? So um, when we do our cooking classes, we pair everything that she prepare, that she makes with wine, um, and then usually there's usually a lag time because I have a two floor um, shop, so it makes it very challenging on many aspects. Um, so at night when we're having the cooking class, we're downstairs in the wine cellar and everybody's pretty focused on that. But what I do is when there's a little space where she needs a little time to get something done, I'll invite people to go upstairs to the shop and offer 10%, 20% off. Um, and we have, have pretty good sales from that. Um, <clears throat> Otherwise, we do a lot of, um, we have distributors come in or suppliers come in and, and do tastings. And those aren't always tied to the housewares, um, but we do a lot of, um, I'm losing my train of thought. <laughs> We do a lot of uh, wine accessories, and so we have some sales driven from that. That's great. Um, I just want to switch gears really quickly and talk about a vendor event. When you have a vendor come in, um, what do you need from a vendor in order to make this event successful for you? And Mary, I'd like to start with you because you're Mary. <laughs> okay. Um, Vendor events are a great way to collaborate and, and build a broader audience. I mean, most vendors today are really into social media also and uh, can participate in advertising and marketing and really help create more outreach for an event than we could necessarily do on our own. 
So I think that uh, we do several events a year that are specifically vendor related and we do some cooking classes that are vendor related also. And uh, it's just a, I think the more that we can do together, the better we are because, and, and we look for a lot of that in events that we do. How can I collaborate with other people in the community? There's a new distillery that just opened, ASW Distillery, and mm. we're gonna have a tour where, you know, it's a class and the first half of the class is a whole tour of the distillery and then we come back to the store and cook with the spirits, okay. you know, and create yeah. a cocktail okay. and create, yeah. so. Um, outside of the box vendors too not necess- that's not something I sell but it's another business that has a completely different base um, that we can tap into so yeah. collaboration is key in mm-hmm. today's business success yeah. <coughs> agreed, agreed. Do you have, I was going to say do you have something you want to add you look like you did no you're good I've got, I've got one pending a vendor event that's a local guy who does wordpress um, print cards mm-hmm. yeah and he's coming over, um, and we're going to do a champagne event because he does these fabulous champagne uh, verses, and he'll sign off on them. And it's already just one card's gone out, and it's already gaining a lot of traction. Wow. Getting champagne ready for thinking about down the road into the year. So, yeah. yeah, yeah that's yeah. awesome. Mm-hmm. So that's something we haven't done yet, just um, being so, so new, but we want to. Um, and I would like to understand maybe more about like how operationally do you work with the vendor to set up the event? So like, do you need to pre-order a whole bunch of things? Do you offer discounts on those type of items? Does the vendor send in like a special expert to talk about the specific item that maybe you're featuring in the class? Or is there a line of products that you want to feature in the class? Feel free. All of the above. (laughs) So yeah, so what are the things, like if we were going to do that, that we need to look for or make sure that we do with the vendor on a partner level? I mean, so you want to create different interest and um, opportunity for your consumers with that event than you would have on a day-to-day basis. So is it a new product that the vendor's releasing? Is it a new line? Is it a new item? Definitely I would have some sort of uh, special, in-store special on however many items you wanted to feature for that evening. If it's a cooking class, whatever you're using in the class, maybe they have a a percentage off of that. Um, Definitely have the vendor participate with you. Um, they're great salespeople, generally, uh, mm-hmm. depending on the company, but some better than others. But uh, you definitely want to have them in your stores and have that other authority um, who's there and representing them as well as you and your staff. And I would have them come in early and do some training and make sure that everybody on your team is up to speed with what's going to happen. Yeah. I've had, <clears throat> excuse me, I've had several vendors offer. So ScanPan, for example, um, has offered to come in. Um, Wistoff offers to come in and do knife skills. Mm-hmm. Um, do you typically do the events during the day or in the evening or both? Uh, both. Mm-hmm. So if they're going to come in, if they'll come in for a couple of days, then you definitely want to leverage as many different opportunities because you know people are busy or they're working. Some people are available or during the day. Some in the evening. We tend to have more people in the evening, mm-hmm. but it kind of depends on where you are too and what the traffic flow is like. But uh, the support um, that the vendors can provide, I mean, we're up 48% this year with ScanPan alone. And we had a huge staff training back in October and they participated. And just having your staff be able to utilize the, maybe somebody doesn't have a piece of ScanPan at home and now they do and they cook with it. And when somebody walks in the store and they say, what's your favorite nonstick? I mean, it's their go-to. So all of that training and education and experience really generate sales. Um, Where have you seen the most success in marketing your events, whether it's a vendor-driven event or something that you've come up with on your own? Um, Has it been through social media? Has it been through, um, you know, your website or newsletters or um, anything like that? And you know what, Merrick, I'm going to start with you on that question. Facebook is predominantly, but sometimes we have to Um, use the email list as well but pretty much everything comes from Facebook Facebook Mm -hmm. okay Jamie what about you Instagram Um, a lot of people tag um, friends and then it brings more people to my page as well but um, the Instagram and then I do newsletters as well for the people that aren't um, there's a lot of people opting out of um, social media as well so I feel like that's huge yeah 
Yeah, Susan, what about you? Pretty much social media and social media. newsletters. I mean, we as it gets closer, we will send, you know, lots of reminders because people will say, oh, I mean, they may not notice it. Mm-hmm. Right, <laughs> right. So is everybody kind of advertising mostly on social media? Anybody advertise somewhere different for an event? Depending on the event, mm-hmm. I may use some print. And really? Because, yeah, well, our customers are a little bit older mm-hmm. and then, and there's certain, but it's very specific. I mean, we do one um, coupon-type magazine, but it's very popular for us and brings in a lot of people. That's great. I don't know if anyone else it, uh, does it this way, but we actually see quite a bit more um, success with our email blast outs or newsletters um, because I, of the way we handle it. So when we build our email list of subscribers when we and create a, our new classes that are coming up, we email them first. So they are the first to know. <clears throat> Um, versus creating it on Facebook and putting it out at the exact same time. Mm-hmm. So when someone comes in and, and says, you know, oh, we see you do all these classes, but they're always full. Then we say, okay, well, you need to go subscribe to our email uh, newsletter because then you're the first to know. You can click right from the email to go sign up and then you have your spot because it goes out before we post it on social media. So when we do that, we actually have classes that sell out or are already half full by the time we post it on social media. Wow. And then it goes on social media and then it finishes. So um, kind of giving it that uh, exclusivity almost mm-hmm. uh, really has made our email newsletter a lot more successful. So That's a great idea. We started doing that as well, and my email <clears throat> list grew. So yeah, it that goes way. fast. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> wow. That's really great. Um, so what about, and I know Jamie, you're really good at this. Jamie does really cool classes like wreath making and things like that. So somebody who's not coming into your class, uh, your store to take a cooking class or who wants a new spatula or a new whisk, how are you kind of capturing those people from kind of out of the box classes that do tie into the home and the kitchen? So yeah, we're trying to just do like entertaining. Um, so for um, fall and Christmas, we're really going to bring in the aspect of maybe you're going to come in and make, I have space to do like a garland. And then while they're doing that, we will talk about maybe some easier appetizers to make and we'll get gadgets out. And so the person that yeah never uses or is not in the kitchen, I'm finding um, they're buying gadgets that way because I have their attention. So we're trying to do more entertaining as well and then add the cooking in to it. Yeah, how has that kind of grown your your customer base now? Yeah, it's really brought in a lot of people. We're even doing things like, I have a park across the street, so we've done um, yoga, and then they come in and do have mimosas, and we do a brunch board. So just doing different, um, yeah, I'm just trying to do it all, just to bring people in, just um, trying not just to, um, yeah, I'm losing my train of thought, but um, not focusing on the people that are already in the kitchen. I um, am trying to bring the people that are really scared um, to be in the kitchen. So I don't have I don't have an intimidating kitchen. So I have a toaster oven, and I feel like people feel a little more comfortable using something like that. Um, so yeah, that's my main focus right now is just bringing people into the kitchen that are not in the kitchen. What I'm finding is. Um, a lot of people have beautiful kitchens, but they're not using them. Mm-hmm. So I, I'm a little different. I started off with the truck, um, and so you can actually shop the truck. So I focus a lot on gyms and studios. Um, so they have boot camp. Boot camp is very popular right now, and so they have their first side gathering. And I come in, and I talk about maybe the top five or ten gadgets I would use for food prep. And um, I get their attention that way, and I've been inviting gyms to come in for classes. So I'm getting people from out um, other cities coming in, and we'll talk about that, and they love it. Um, They love seeing how a spiralizer works because they're very intimidated by it. Or um, I do a lot with the veggie chop. Um, um, I'm getting people that are buying scam pans that don't know they need a scan pan, but once they see how an egg is cooked in it, um, it makes life a lot easier. So 
I guess my focus is more on the people that are not in the kitchen versus in the kitchen. Yeah, exactly. Once you get the new customers in your store from an event, because your repeat customers are loyal and they'll come back for things like that. But when you get a new customer, how are you converting them to a return customer? Well, people are so excited when they come into the store because we're, we're a new kind of store on the street and, and, and when they come in, this, they, they, they always say this is the best store in town. So we, we, we have an email list in the front and just in nine months, we've, we have 2,500 people on our email list. That's wonderful. So, and I do email very seldom because people don't like to be spammed, but you know, I'll send out email newsletters and those subscribers get a special deal every month. They'll come in for their special deal. So I'm testing different things on mm. what is drawing them in. Um, telling them what the cocktail is going to be for the first Friday, and then they're always excited about that and what the special is going to be at the first Friday. Um, so that's working for us, as well as Facebook. So Facebook is slowly growing, but my email newsletter is, is what's drawing people in. That's really great to hear. Mary, what about you? How do you convert um, new customers into returning <coughs> customers? Well, we, I mean, we really focus on um, having a super kind, generous, knowledgeable staff. Mm. So when they come in the mm. store, they need to, what I say to my staff all the time is they need to leave happier than they came in. Mm -hmm. All the time. And I mean, I think that's how you create loyalty and a, a returning customer because you go where you know you're gonna have a good time or a great experience and then you'll go back to that place. So mm. we try to be people's happy place to be. So Tamara, you have a lot of tourists, you, yes. you were saying, so how do you kind of get the tourists to come back to you if, right. if it's a place that they vacate or... Well, it's a, it's unique there, obviously. We've got this tourist group, but they're, some are part-time residents too. Mm -hmm. So we do have some of them cycling back around and if we can, fi we figure that out. A lot of conversation goes on in the shop. It's similar. I mean, they become friends, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and you develop these relationships with people that literally maybe you haven't seen, but every now I'm learning about every two years. But they remember you, mm -hmm. and it's it's great. I create I I installed an app card, a loyalty program, um, and they're all so excited by that. Um, it's they give up their email and they give up their uh, phone number, and it's just tied in with their phone number. And if they so choose, they can put their birthday in there. Now this is what has brought some of them, I'm not kidding, brought some of them back. <laughs> they get a piece of free birthday cheese. <laughs> We've built um, something in the wine cellar called the 359 Club, and it's basically a social hour, but it's brought a lot of people who didn't, who've lived there their whole lives and didn't know that my shop was there. Yeah. Um, because a lot of people that live in the area just don't go downtown. Um, so parking is kind of an issue, so it's really trying to find some way to bring people in, even if it's with alcohol, um, <laughs> you do what you gotta do, mm -hmm. but then they'll go upstairs and see um, the shop and see that they can get a hostess gift there or a gadget, um, coffee, so it helps, that's helped, again, alcohol works, um, that's helped build our, our base. That's great. Mm -hmm. I'm how does your loyalty program work, basically? I mean, what's the everyday loyalty? The everyday? Yeah. So, um, I up to when they get to $100, it tracks their purchases. So your point of sale system? It's the point of sale system, right? And it's an app, and, and it tracks their purchases. So for every 100 bucks, they get a $5 coupon. And, and you keep that in the store, or they... It's all it driven on the on app. The receipt, or? It's on the app. It's a 100% app on their phone. They have to be on, they have to mm -hmm. subscribe their app. Mm -hmm. they, they, have to have they give up their phone number. We put that in at the time of purchase. And then it tracks their sales. I don't have to do a thing with it. I, of course, I'm paying for that app, but it's very affordable, super reasonable. And it has, I can track the numbers on it. And just that alone, the customers that have the app and are loyal customers, Week by week, I see in their sales alone um, anywhere from six to fifteen percent increases in their personal sales. So they're buying more, you know. And so in the long run, it's it's a gain, you know. Yeah, yeah. So seasonally, um, are you guys seeing more of a demand for events in the winter or in the summer or both? I mean, only because 
in the summer everybody wants to be out, but in the winter everybody kind of wants something to do. So I don't know. Melissa, how about you? Yeah, there's definitely a difference. Um, lots of times just scheduling in the summer with families going on vacation and the kids being out of school. Summers seem to be a little bit more hectic for people. Uh, but once the kids are back in school, once it's colder outside, yeah, we're really pumping the events out, especially around uh, the holidays, so private events, for instance, booking private events for companies or organizations, uh, and then our public events, uh, people are just, you know, wanting to do something all the time, but we kind of space it out uh, during the summertime just because it seems like people are gone or, yeah, so, outside. Yeah. What about you? We don't do as much in the summer. We do kids' camps to try and help. Um, our strongest time is probably January through April. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, when we see the most uh, attendance at classes and things like that. We'll do fun events to that are more feel good for the customer. I mean, come October, because you want to bring people in, that's a slow month. We'll do our Light Crusade event. It's our anniversary month. So we'll do things like that. Um, a fun thing that we do in December with our kitchen is Breakfast with Santa. Uh, you know, which will bring the fam families in. We've gotten known for that. I mean, um, we usually fill up all our seatings. What do you do? We do kind of a buffet type breakfast. I mean, we'll just do some scrambled eggs, um, sausage, bacon. Um, we sell Stonewall Kitchen, so we do waffles and then I'll make some cinnamon rolls. And we have seatings and then we usually have a Santa there that you know the kids can go sit on and we limit it it's um, eight families for each seating okay. mm. that's great oh. what about you um we we do classes year-round definitely we uh summer kids camps we do we're up to 16 weeks of kid, kids camps this year um those are really popular and then um and it's 16 weeks among the three stores so it's not Full 16 weeks, summer's not even that long for the kids anymore. <laughs> um, and then law firms, we've done a lot of business with law firms. Some are intern, entertaining. Really? Uh, that's yeah. been really popular and a good one. So uh, all of our corporate team building is pretty strong in the summertime. <laughs> we do a lot in the wintertime too. I mean, definitely December is a huge month for client entertaining and holiday parties and things like that. But um, summer stays fairly strong in the cooking schools. Good for you. Good. I've learned, um, like, because this is new, I decided to fill my June up with workshops to see if they'd fill up and July, and they are, and they're bringing in a lot more traffic. My sales are definitely up because it's bringing people into the store. Right. That's great. Does um, every, excuse me. Does everyone on the panel have cooking schools? Does anybody not? We don't. Okay. Yeah. Well, you know what? For the guys that don't have cooking schools, what kind of events are you doing that, you know, do bring people back in? Well, being super small town, we kind of, as a collective, all of us do things together. So we have festivals that we're known for, um, and our first Fridays are also big draws. And we put, you know, our membership dollars go towards things like we have a green space, so we always have a band on first Fridays. That brings a lot of folks into town. And it can be local talent. Sometimes we pay for bigger talent. It just depends what's available. Um, and then I have, I promote tastings inside the shop, different things. New wines are big in my uh, town. Folks want to try new wines all the time. Um, since we have limited restaurants, they can't have every single wine, so we'll, we, we look outside of that. And we've gotten known to be like the kind of eclectic boutique collection of wine in, in the area, and that's pretty neat. And then of course pairings, doing the pairings with that. So when you work with other local stores, kind of what are some of the best practices to host events with them and collaborate with them? Well, similar to what Mary was saying with the distillery, we have a distillery, we have a brewery, um, bringing those folks into town. So doing like their little, I can't sell, I can't sell on site their product, right. but they can come in and we can talk about what pairs with what they already are selling. Um, I do have the cidery can come in because I can sell the cider with my license, and we've uh, brought them in. Um, and our other 
um, shops will do similar things. Like they'll bring in, they'll have their vendor showcases, whether it's the clothing boutiques will bring in trunk shows or, you know, the gallery will bring in an artist and have them in. And so we're all talking or, or very aware of, okay, on this particular weekend, what we got going on? Um, dog and cat uh, and pet owner uh, 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 events are good. Um, you know, we'll have like, a, we'll, I know, right, we'll have a, the sponsor, you know, the, the gallery up the road will have um, something in that the wine sells that night, the proceeds will go to the SPCA, and we all know about it, so we're all driving, you know, towards each other, which is great, so that's how a lot works. Mm -hmm.